Hey everybody, Will here. Thanks for tuning in. In today's video, we're going to take a very practical look at how you can begin to set up your Kima sound design environment, or at least some part of the environment. As you know, it's a deep system. There's many places and windows uh, to work with, and this is just going to be uh, sort of a start to that process. By the end of the video, you'll have a good understanding of what a Kima sound is, why it's different from other sounds in other environments, for example in a digital audio workstation. You'll know how to save it, which again is uh, a bit of a different process and uh, there's typically a lot of confusion around it, especially for new users. So you can follow along step by step and there'll be a lot to learn uh, doing it that way, but of course making it your own and sort of expanding on what I'm going to offer you, that's where the real magic is. As always, I'm going to itemize or section off the parts in the description so you can kind of skip and revisit the parts and, and have that uh, sort of bookmarked for you. If you're new here, welcome. Thanks for being here. If you're into this kind of thing, be sure to get involved in the comments and the dialogue and subscribe to the channel. And if you're not into this sort of thing, go ahead and do it anyway. I'm going to start by launching Kima. Yours probably looks just about the same unless you've customized your preferences, which is what we're going to do first. So I'm going to go to the Kima 7 menu, Preferences. I'd encourage you to look through here and familiarize yourself with it, but for this right now I'm going to go to Miscellaneous. And here is where we see a few things that we're going to adjust right now so that we can clean up our windows and the way this looks when Kima launches. This one says show help on startup. This window here is the help so I'm going to say no. Show untitled window on startup. The untitled window is this kind of reddish gray one back here. That's a multi-grid um, that's unnamed and in this case the untitled window so I'm going to say no. This window here is the Cappy Talk of the day, and that, that too uh, can be toggled here. I, I personally like to have that. Um, one piece of fish I do enjoy, even though I'm a vegetarian, so I'll leave that on. And that will be enough for now. This time around, I will have to close these windows, but when Kima launches each subsequent time now, those uh, preferences will be saved. All right, so this is our output level. You'll notice when I adjust this fader with the mouse, it also adjusts here. So I can close this one out as well. If you don't have this DSP status, go to the DSP menu, click status, and that'll open it up. I like to have this window open for a few reasons. One, you can see your output of your sound. Two, you can see the processing of it. Um, it's also nice to make sure you've got everything set up. This is where you adjust uh, and change your interface, sample rate, and so on. One convenient thing that uh, recently came out in an update is the ability to hide this. So once you get this set up, you typically don't need to change it. If you double click anywhere in this white area, that will go away and you can bring it back via a double click. Then I get this in a bit more convenient area. And we're starting to customize our layout uh, here. The next thing you should know right away, the first things I learned in Kima uh, were Command K for kill, kill the sound. And that's under here under the DSP, you see stop, Command K. This will 100% of the time, every time, kill a sound. And at some point, unfortunately, you're going to play a, an ear shatteringly loud sound. Um, and Command K is going to help uh, you, you save your ears and save your monitors. So that works every time. Spacebar won't always work for you. Sometimes it does stop a sound. Sometimes it, it restarts and it replays a sound. So I get in the habit of Command K. I probably overuse it, um, but it, it, it's a very good thing to have. The other thing um, in sticking with that sort of loudness, um, is having your hand close by to the volume knob when you play a sound, especially an unfamiliar sound. So if you have a monitor control, uh, it's advisable to mute the output or dim it and then look at the 
level here in the DSP status and you know make an educated decision whether you want to hear that sound or not obviously if it's clipping uh, horribly you don't want to hear that now let's take a look at the sound browser which is this actually both these windows here I'll close one of these out just so you can see if you for some reason you don't have this window you can always get it back via file sound browser and I'll go ahead and do that now um, so when you do that you get access or a visual on everything on your disk even unrelated things to Kima what's really cool is if you double click on anything that's black or gray you can spawn a new sound browser from that point what I like to do is have my Kima 7 folder and within that I have my sound library so I'll double click and spawn another one there sound files this is where we save our sounds and then I do a lot of sample based sounds so I have a folder here and then you can kind of configure these however you want I have multiple monitors set up so I can position these wherever I want um, you obviously have to decide if that makes sense for you one thing that's nice is Kima has I guess a, sort of a state memory that if you leave these op these windows open when you close Kima the next time you open it and launch it uh, they'll open right back up and, and stay there so kind of a cool thing for things that you readily and regularly access um, to have available for you so this is a fairly typical setup that I, I have and I think it's easier to navigate. Let's take a look at uh, sound files. This is sort of where all the sounds, your sounds and your library gets saved initially. This is where sounds get saved and then they go out to other environments which I'll show you. So you'll notice within this folder I have all these blue .kym sounds which are sound files. And then within those sounds, if I click this arrow, I have specific sounds. That one only ha that sound file only has one sound. If I go to this sound file, I see that it has many more sounds, and I can play them right from here by highlighting it and either pressing play or pressing spacebar. Now, one important concept to understand in Kima that might not be immediately obvious is the ability to see things from a different perspective or in a different way but we're looking at the same thing so it's a bit like a, a bird's eye view as opposed to a you know a ground level view nothing actually really changes it's just the perspective so to show you what I mean we're looking at a sound file here this WJK alarm sfx.kym and within that we have all these which are sounds if I double click this now I have this sound file open in this format and we see all those sounds with their icons so you will notice that all these names are the exact same over here because this is this and then from here I can highlight and press play with the spacebar or I can get inside the sound sort of under the hood by double clicking and now I see this sound in all its constituent parts so for a long time I didn't get the idea that this was a sound file over here and that when I opened it I was actually seeing the same thing so kind of useful um, again it, oftentimes we're looking at the same thing just sort of in a different form uh, this leads me to talk about how, how to save so say I have a sound and I want to make a sound and then I want to save it how would you go about doing that so to get a sound file you go to file new sound file when it launches you know it's just a blank white window which looks if these weren't here it looks the exact same because that's how this sound file started now I'm here 
and you just, once you make sounds, you just drag them in here. And so I'm going to show you what that might look like now. So say I build a sound, press Command B, go to Oscillator. Say I was building some sort of synth here and just for the sake of this example, say I have, you know, made a couple of changes. I've got this sound. And say I'm ready to name it, so I press enter on the sound I want to change, and we'll just call this oscillator version one. Okay. Now I take this and I just drag and drop it here. And then what I'll do right away to avoid any confusion is close this out. When it asks me if I want to keep the changes, I'm going to say no. And so now nothing's been saved. I've just set myself up to save. I'll click this window to bring it to the forefront and I'll go to file, save as, and I'll give it a meaningful name. I'll just call this BJK test save version one. And I'll make sure that it goes into my sound files folder within my sound library and I'll hit save. We notice that it changed from untitled to the name I just gave it and .kym. So now this is a sound file uh, that contains this sound. If I close this out and I go back over to this view within the sound browser, I notice that it's not in here just yet. So I have to close the root folder, open it back up, and then here it is, WJK test save version one. You see if I open it, oscillator version one, there it is. I double click, there's what we just made. So that's a really clean way of going about saving initially. A lot of people get confused about copying and duplicates and overwriting, but if you go about it that way, um, it should be a lot more clear. Now what about if you already have a sound file and you just want to add to it? Well, it's the same thing. You just kind of add on to this. So you would just drag and drop sounds into here. So for example, say I wanted to go back to my sound I made, some sort of sample based sound. I can just take it, after I make it and drag it in here and then go up to file and go to save and that will save this sound file. One other thing that's cool too is you'll notice that all of these sounds are within alarm sound effects. So seemingly or it would make sense that all these are related in some capacity and they are. So say I just want to make some sort of small change to one of these. I can open it up by double clicking and then I can make changes here. So say I wanted to change the sample and have a different version. I'll just put uh, a sample I know the name of, which is phrase, which you can just type it in there within single quotes if you know the name. And then come over here, press enter, and change to version three, say. And then I can just take this and drag it over into my sound file. And what I'll do right away is close this out it's going to ask me if I want to save. If I was to save now, it's going to overwrite that original one, which I don't want to do. So I'm going to hit no. You notice I have my original here untouched in the sound I just made. Now again, nothing has been saved. So I have to go up to file and then hit save. And that will save this sound file with these contents. So if you go about saving your sounds in that way, that's a, a clean way that hopefully eliminates the confusion. Now, one other thing I want to talk about in regards to the sound file and a concept, a bigger concept in Kima is something I'm going to show you now in the Finder. So if I go into the Finder and I find these sound files on my disk, I'll find that same alarm 
sound file we've been working with, you'll notice here that this sound file is 189 kilobytes. <laughs> That's so small by today's sort of standards that it almost seems like a mistake. If this was in your digital audio workstation full of sounds and you would and you opened it up and saw that it was that small, you could almost be positive that it's a mistake. But in Kima, this isn't a mistake actually. And the reason is that this sound file, which contains these sounds that we've been looking at, these are not a recording. They are an algorithm. Each one of these is a, uh, an algorithm or a set of instructions, which is what an algorithm is, for your hardware accelerator, which is the Paca, the Pacarana, or maybe you're still using the Capybara. In any case, it's a set of instructions for the sound as it unfolds in real time. So that's a very different concept, uh, very different from a recording, which in your digital audio workstation, you always started, you typically start with some sort of recording. You're recording audio, whether an instrument or a voice. This is, uh, this is not like that. Even though there's a sample in this, which is a recording, it's just saying, hey, grab that sample and read it from the disc or load it into the RAM on your hardware accelerator. So big concept to, to understand and that's the reason why uh, these are so small. Okay, so that's a brief look at how you can start to customize your layout, uh, your preferences, and the windows you're gonna see in Kima, and how to navigate and, and use the sound browser a bit more, and how to save. Hopefully that uh, cuts through the noise on, on, or confusion if there was any, on how to save within a sound file. And then in future videos, we'll take a look at, now that we have that sound file, how we can take those sounds and take them into other things like the multi-grid and the timeline. Uh, but it's important concept to understand how to make a sound file and how to save. And uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.